Greetings, beloved, and thank you for joining me here at May United Methodist Church as we gather together for worship for September 22nd, 2024. We continue a sermon series called The Story of Daniel, um, and so we're going to be exploring for the next few weeks um, the narratives of Daniel and some of the prophetic um, apocalyptic visions that are included in the book of Daniel. And so we call ourselves into this time and place with these words from the first psalm. Happy are those who delight in the law of the Lord. They are like trees planted by streams of water. They yield their fruit in season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. The Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Let us pray together. Glorious God, come to us anew this day. We come before you with both anxiety and hope. As we sing and pray, remove our fears and insecurities and give us the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Amen. So I'm going to share with you a reading today from the second chapter of Daniel. I'm going to give you the first 23 verses. Um, and so... In the story of Daniel, if you've not had a chance to read it or if it's been a while, um, this idea of having visions and dreams is, is incredibly central to the story. Um, there's an, an unfolding pattern where the, the king, Nebuchadnezzar, who is the king of Babylon, right? So for us to remember that Daniel and, um, and the friends of his that are mentioned, they are part of what is called the diaspora, right? So when King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon conquers the area of Judea and conquers the city of Jerusalem, he takes about 90% of the residents and scatters them through the Babylonian empire. Um, the idea behind this would be that it's much easier to assimilate people in small groups into like local places um, where they become the minority instead of the majority. Um, and also, it's much harder to have an uprising if you're scattered across a huge empire than if you are localized together. So that's sort of the strategy the king is using. In addition to that, um, in the first chapter, King Nebuchadnezzar gives the order for young men, sort of what we would think of as teenagers, probably ages 14, 15, maybe even as old as 16, um, are gathered and they are um, and brought to the Babylonian capital. Um, and, the, and they're all um, the sons of like the royal lines, right? So not royalty the way we particularly think of it, but noble houses, if you will. So the important families, the families of power in the city of Jerusalem, one of their sons um, who looks good, is intelligent, and that kind of thing, is brought to the capital city with the idea of assimilating them into Babylonian culture as well. They're going to learn um, the, the Chaldean language. They're going to learn about Chaldean literature and about the Chaldean gods, and they're going to dress that way, and they're going to eat that way, um, and that's how it starts. And so in the first chapter, Daniel and his friends sort of stand up against that. They say, no, we will not eat your food. It's, it's unclean. It's not kosher. Um, this is not what God asked us to do. And in sort of standing that line, they actually, God blesses them, and so they look healthier than um, all the other um, men who have been eating this, the, um, the Babylonian food. And, um, and so the king says, okay, and the king sort of acknowledges the power of Daniel's God. All right, and so now um, some time has passed, and we're going to pick it up in the second chapter where King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's <coughs> I am so sorry. <clears throat> Let me try that again. In the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's rule, he had many dreams. The dreams made him anxious, but he kept sleeping. The king summoned the dream interpreters, enchanters, diviners, and Chaldeans to explain his dream to him. They came and stood before the king, and then the king said to them, I had a dream and I'm anxious to know its meaning. The Chaldeans answered the king in Aramaic, Long live the king! Tell your servants the dream, and we will explain its meaning. The king answered the Chaldeans, My decision is final. If you can't tell me the dream and its meaning, you will be torn limb from limb, and your houses will be turned into trash dumps. But if you do explain the dream and its meaning, 
You'll receive generous gifts and glorious honor from me. So explain to me the dream as well as its meaning. They answered him again. The king must tell his servants the dream. We will then explain the meaning. The king replied, now I definitely know you are stalling for time because you see that my decision is final and that if you can't tell me the dream, your fate is certain. You've conspired to make false and lying speeches before me until the situation changes. Tell me the dream now, then I'll know you can explain its meaning to me. And the Chaldeans answered the king, no one on earth can do what the king is asking. No king or ruler, no matter how great, has ever asked such a thing of any dream interpreter, enchanter, or Chaldean. What the king is asking is impossible. No one could declare the dream to the king but the gods, who don't live among mere humans. At this, the king exploded in a furious rage and ordered that all Babylonian sages be wiped out. So the command went out. The sages were to be killed. Daniel and his friends, too, were hunted down. They were to be killed as well. Then Daniel, with wisdom and sound judgment, responded to Arioch, the king's chief executioner, who had gone out to kill Babylon's sages. He said to Arioch, the king's royal officer, why is the king's command so unreasonable? After Arioch explained the situation to Daniel, Daniel went and asked the king to give him some time so he could explain the dream's meaning to him. Then Daniel went to his house and explained the situation to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, so that they would ask the God of heaven for help about this mystery, in hopes that Daniel and his friends wouldn't die with the rest of Babylon's sages. Then, in a vision by night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel. Daniel praised the God of heaven. God's name be praised from age to eternal age. Wisdom and might are his. God is the one who changes times and eras, who dethrones one king only to establish another, who grants wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those with insight. God is the one who uncovers what lies deeply hidden. He knows what hides in darkness. Light lives in him. I acknowledge and praise you, my Father's God. You've given me wisdom and might, and now you've made known to me what we asked of you. You've made known to us the king's demand. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Maybe we aren't all sages in an ancient empire facing a death threat from an unreasonable king. But in our own times and in our own ways, we all face what seem to be insurmountable, impossible to overcome situations. And my question for you is this. As a disciple of Christ, when you face one of those moments, how do you respond? Will you ponder and reflect on that while you hear the song of reflection? In moments like these, I sing out a song. I sing out a love song to Jesus. In moments like these, Beloved, will you pray with me? Almighty and glorious God, we've come to be with you, 
to hear your word and to have you speak with us this day. I offer myself up to you, O oh God, and humbly ask that you overcome me and that you move me out of your way. Protect all who hear this message so that no harm would ever come from my words, but instead that you might bless my mouth and use my words to speak to all who hear this message, that it might be a blessing upon them, guiding them in their lives of discipleship of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. When I read this story in Daniel, one, I don't particularly like Nebuchadnezzar. Like, what is his problem, right? It makes, so I found myself wondering, what happens between the end of chapter 1 and the start of chapter 2 that clearly... The king is either suspicious, doubting, um, feels that he can no longer trust, you know, the diviners, the magicians, the dream interpreters, right? It's, it's a very different mystical world, you know, in, in this time frame, um, somewhere around 26, 2,500 years ago, give or take um, a couple decades. And, and so a really different way of understanding the world and um, and that leaders would often be spoken to by the gods through visions and dreams. And we see this to be true, right? We, you know, in the, um, in the major prophets of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, many visions, many dreams, and God is talking to them. Um, but typically a, a prophet of, of our Lord is also given the wisdom to understand those dreams, right? So, um, so they don't need help. Whereas, you know, a king, um, you know, in a, in an empire, he has all this, these people that are supposed to help him understand what his dreams mean and help him make good ruling decisions. So I don't know how they've disappointed him or what's unfolded, but I kind of feel bad for all of those people because it does seem like an impossible ask, right? Like if I said to you, all right, I had a dream last night, so I want you to tell me the details of my dream, and then I want you to tell me what you think it means, like how should I use it in my life. Wouldn't your first question be just like the Chaldeans? Well, Amanda, tell me the dream. How am I supposed to know the details of your dream? That's, an, that's stupid, right? That's impossible. So I really agree with them on that. And the king says, <laughs> I've made my decision. You can either do this, either you are wise enough and powerful enough in these skills that you have to be able to not only be able to interpret my dream, but to know the details of it, or you don't. And if you don't, it means you've been selling me stories, and I'm going to have you all executed. And that's exactly what happens. Like, some part of me is like, wow, that seems like an immense, impossible thing to ask, and a huge overreaction. Like, I'm going to ask you to do something that's really kind of ridiculous and impossible, and if you can't do it, then I'm going to have you killed. It's like, wow, wow, right? Like, hmm, I don't really know what to do with that. And I thought, man, I'm glad I didn't have to face a situation like that. And then I got to thinking about the experiences of life. Now, I have never stood before a king. No one has ever asked me to give them the details of their dreams and then interpret them. Um, you know, so, so not this exact situation. But I thought there have definitely been a number of moments in my life where what was being asked of me, whether it was, you know, living through an experience, whether it was a task that I had been given by another, um, you know, an exam or a certification or, you know, an interview of some kind to pass, that there have been those moments where it feels like what's being asked of me is far beyond what I can possibly do, right? Like, it feels impossible. It feels, I like the word, insurmountable, right? That it can't be overcome. And at the same time, while my physical life has never been under threat, those moments, whether true or not, can feel life balancing, right? That like, if I don't pass this certification exam, if I don't get certified in this moment in whatever the profession is, then I can't get a job and I can't, and it feels like our whole life hinges on this one moment, right? And then there are those moments that just feel like I don't, I'm not strong enough to, to get through this, right? Like those 
phases of life that I've come to find that truly everyone goes through at some point where it's just one hard thing after another, right? Maybe it's um, illness followed by um, a job loss followed by a destruction to your home. Like it's just one of those moments where like any one of those pieces we all would have compassion and empathy for because we hate watching anybody go through any one. When we hear one of those stories where like someone's had like four immediate family members die in just a few months or, you know, a series of things unfolding um, in a year. And, you know, we just think, oh, my God, like, how are they still standing upright? And when we're going through them ourselves, we think, I, I'm not going to survive this. This, this is going to, this is going to take me. Right? So even though we're not standing before a king, I think in some ways we can relate to the situation that not only the Chaldeans are in, but then Daniel and his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, find themselves in. Right? They are a part of this group. They, are, they have been deemed after the experience of the first chapter to be wise. They have been incorporated into this group of advisors, if you will. Um, and I mean, it doesn't seem like they're even in the original conversation, but maybe they witness it, and they're about to be executed, right? The the chief executioner comes to them and is like, all right, you got to come, and this is what we're going to do. And and I feel like the first thing that Daniel does is the first thing we all do when we face an impossible moment. Whatever the circumstances are, he asks, why? Right? Like, and, you know, his question to the executioner, why is the king's command so unreasonable? Like, what? what is the king thinking? Why is the king doing this? And we don't really get that answer ever, right? Um, when his dream is revealed, it, it maybe becomes a little bit clearer that the dream itself feels threatening. Um, and so I feel like the king isn't going to just trust any old person with that dream because um, I think he feels like it could really be used against him. Um, and so that kind of becomes clear in the second half of Daniel chapter 2, if you want to grab your Bible and, and, and check that out. Um, yeah, so maybe that's where he's coming from, right? We're, we're not, but I feel like that's what we all do. When we are in sort of some input, why? Why is this happening? You know, why am I the one going through this? Um, you know, like, why? Right, isn't that kind of where we all start? Um, and I think in that moment, when we're in that place of why, is a really pivotal moment of faith for all of us. Because in some way, when we're asking, why is this happening? Or why is this happening to me, right? What have I done that's so bad? Why, you know, what did I do to deserve this? And, and the answers always are nothing, right? It, it, it's part of life that we will face these moments. And I, don't under, I can't give you an answer to why. I just know that it is. And we hear that in other places in Scripture, right? The Ecclesiastes author that writes the words that so many, you know, a time for this, a time for that, a time for this. He's not saying it's good that all of these things are. He's saying these things are. And in the course of your life, there will be a time of all of these things. This is what life looks like. And sometimes it's great, and sometimes it's very, very hard. And everything about my human experience and everything I've ever listened to about everybody else's lives tells me that is true, right? Life contains these things. And so when we find ourselves in an impossible moment, when we find ourselves in a why moment, right, what's the next thing we do? As people of faith, as, a, as one who not just believes in Jesus Christ, but accepts Jesus Christ as our Savior, is seeking to build our lives around the law of God, around, around the desires of God, who's seeking to align ourselves with the will of God, what's the next thing? we do. And this is why I love this part of the story of Daniel, because Daniel gives us an answer, not to the why. That never gets answered. It stays unanswered. And I think that is very real in our lives. We will continue to ask why. And I don't know that we will ever have a satisfying answer. Even if somebody could answer, I'm not sure there'd be an answer they could give that would be enough if the why is, why is someone I love dying? Why is someone who is perhaps younger than me or my child or someone very young dying? There is no answer that's going to satisfy us about that, right? What answer would make me feel okay about a child dying of cancer, mine or others, right? It just isn't going to happen. So what do we do in those moments? And Daniel does two things. And we are told it is because of his wisdom and sound judgment, and that's exactly how we describe it 
the, the wisdom that God has given him rises up and he does two things that I think we can all embrace. First, he seeks community, right? He, he seeks others that he knows are his brothers and sisters in God, right? Christ hasn't yet uh, come in, in Daniel's moment, so we would use the, the I, you know, that term of brothers and sisters in Christ. Part of the, they're part of his faith. They're, they're his church, if you will, right? These three good friends that have been through all his experiences with him, and they also stood firm in that first chapter. They do that with Daniel. He doesn't do it alone. The four of them do that together to say, we will not bend the asks of God to the will of a king. We, we will not do it. Um, and, and so they've probably bonded in that, right? So, so he goes to three trustworthy brothers of faith and shares what he's going through with them. I mean, they're in the same situation, but but says to them, all right, we need to be in this together. I think there's such a deep lesson in that for all of us because so often, and I think this comes perhaps from this sense of like, as Americans, as um, we, we really um, tend to value individualism and the strength of an individual. And there are moments where that's really powerful, but because of that, sometimes we don't lean upon one another. We don't share our burdens in healthy ways, right? We don't reach out to our very best friends, to the people of faith that we know we can trust, to our mentors and say, this is happening and I can't hold it alone. I can't hold it. It's not because they can fix it or make it better. It's not because they're going to be wiser necessarily than Daniel. It's just that now Daniel isn't facing it alone, right? That I feel like there's a lesson that people of faith don't face things alone. We have a community. And that's intentional. It's always been a part of God's plan. From the beginning, God has put people into families, created a community of followers, and that has continued into the time of Christ and into our time. And so the first thing Daniel says is he gathers other people of faith so he doesn't have to walk this alone, that no disciple should walk alone. And what he asks of them is not to solve the problem, to not tell him what he should do, to not even say, I need your sympathy, right? He doesn't need to like, oh, Daniel, that's really hard. That's not, he's not looking for any of those things. He goes to his three trusted friends of faith and says, will you pray with me? Wow. And we do this in some ways, right? Will you, will you hold me in your prayers, right? Like, we, we, we will do that. But there is something that we sometimes overlook. And in our world of, of communication, it's so easy to talk to each other without actually being present with one another, like in physical body. Um, and I love that. In moments where it would be impossible, like there's no way for me to transport myself to the state of South Carolina and be with my aunt and uncle. Like I either have to travel. So I love that through texting and FaceTime and emails and all the other things that I can be a part more deeply of their lives, that I can be praying for them and, and things like that. But there is something powerful in our faith of being in person and praying together praying with one another, not for one another, right? So Daniel doesn't say, let's pray for one another. He says, he gathers them together and he says, we need to ask God to help us. So we're going to pray with one another for God to be present, for God to show up and bring into this moment in time the things that only God can bring, whether it's hope, Wisdom, insight, right? Like they need a revelation, right? Like they need to know what this dream is and they need to understand it. So, but it's, you know, in, in our own street, God, I need you to show up and I need courage. I need strength. Um, you know, I need compassion. I need to know I'm loved. I need to know I can be forgiven, right? How often do our own sins become that impossible thing? And the why that we're asking is, why did I do this? Why did I let myself make that choice? And we can't undo it because it's in the past. So it cannot be undone. It has to be lived with. And we bury it deep inside ourselves. We don't speak to others about it. And then it sits like a cancer in our spirits, right? And, and to notice in those moments, we need to go to trust the people of faith and say, this, this is my impossible. This is what I'm dealing with. And will you pray with me? Will you pray with me 
not for a particular outcome necessarily, but will you pray with me for God to show up and for God to guide me in a path of forgiveness, for God to show me what do I need to forgive myself? What do I need to really embrace and know I'm forgiven by God? What do I need to go and ask for forgiveness from someone else if that's a part of my journey? Will you pray with me and ask God to be a part of this impossible moment. Not only do we so often try to get through it ourselves without the help of other human beings, but far too often as disciples, we forget. We forget the spiritual discipline of prayer. And we, we, we want to give such specifics to God, but instead to just invite God to recognize, to be humble and say, God, I, this is impossible for me to even picture what it might look like on the other side of this, because I can't imagine living through this moment. I'm, I'm overwhelmed. And so I'm asking you, God, to be my God that I trust in and to show up with what you know I need, the things that maybe I don't even know to ask for. Be with me, God. And to say to my friends, sit with me and pray this prayer for me. Pray this prayer with me. God, be with us now. And that's a prayer that God answers, right? We may not always know it in the moment. We may not always recognize it. Very often in hindsight, I can look back and be like, ah, I see where God was showing up and doing things. And in the moment, it either didn't feel like enough, I couldn't see it or recognize it in the moment, or it wasn't what I was looking for. That tends to be a trend in my life. When I say I want God to show up, I have a very specific idea of like, this is what it will look like when God does. And then that's typically not what happens, and it's not until I look back that I'm like, oh, yeah, you didn't show up in the way that I specifically thought you would, but look at all the ways that you were with me, God. I, I see that in looking back. So it's very hard in the moment. But in this moment, God answers that prayer, and that night God gives Daniel a vision that shares with Daniel the details of Nebuchadnezzar's dream and the meaning of it. And then Daniel does one more thing that I would say we often forget to do. He praises God. He gives thanks, right? At the, at the heart of praise is a recognition that God is so much mightier than us. To recognize it's not me that generated this vision. It's not because I'm so wise and I'm so amazing, right? It's recognizing I have been blessed. God showed up and gave me what I needed, maybe not what I wanted, but what I needed in this moment to live through this moment in time because God is God, because God can and God did. Thank you. That's really what praise is about, acknowledging who God is and what God is doing. You can't always put it into specific words. doesn't matter, right? That's why praise be to you, oh God, right? And, and the, at the heart of a praise is thank you, right? So here Daniel's words again, right? God's name be praised from age to eternal age. There has never been and will never be a time where God's name should not be praised, where we should not be lifting up God's name. And the first thing that Daniel says is wisdom and might are God's. Wisdom and might are his, right? So Daniel, the minute he wakes up, begins to praise God for the vision that has come to him because he knows it came from God. He knows he couldn't have done it alone. He has this really powerful awareness of that. And he goes on to acknowledge, you know, Kings will come and go. Like God is bigger than kings. God is bigger than empires. God can see through the darkness because God is light itself. Right? And he says in, in verse 23, I acknowledge and praise you, my Father's God. I acknowledge and praise you. You have given me wisdom and might, and now you've made known to me what we asked of you. You've made known to us the king's demand. I acknowledge and praise you. Daniel has not yet survived. It isn't, that's what unfolds next, and he does survive. But in this moment, Daniel doesn't know how it's actually going to play out. You know, he's going to go. He's going to share the vision that God revealed to him. He's going to interpret it. What if this unreasonable, irrational king says, well, that's my dream, but I don't believe you, and hasn't executed anyway? So the good, positive outcome for Daniel has not yet come to be. So Daniel isn't waiting to be safe. 
Daniel isn't waiting until this moment has completely resolved itself to praise God. In the moment when God has shown up, in the moment when God has given Daniel something he could not find on his own, Daniel begins to praise God. Not for my own life, but praise be for God for who you are. I acknowledge and I praise you. Beloved, buried in this very interesting story with a kind of crazy cuckoo king who's being pretty unreasonable, maybe a little hopped up on his own power, in a world full of dreams and visions that feels very challenging for our science-based brains to even wrap our minds around, in a moment in time of empires and conquerings and assimilating cultures, in a moment of time of dreams and interpretation, buried within that story, within those details, perhaps as something deeper for us to see. Not the details of the dream, but the details of Daniel's discipleship. That when he faces an impossible moment, he seeks community of faith. He asks them to pray with him. They pray for God to show up, for God to be God. And when God does, even before the outcome is known, they acknowledge and praise God. Thank you, God showing up. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your courage. Thank you for the strength. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. In our impossible moments, the next time we face a moment and we find ourselves saying, why? Why is this happening? Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to my friend? Why? Why is this part of life? Why does this even happen at all? that Daniel would come into our minds and that we would go to our community of faith, go to our friends of faith that we know can be counted upon and say, pray with me. Pray with me for God to show up and give me what I need in this moment to overcome it. And when we do notice that God shows up, even if our loved one is not yet healed, even if we do not yet have a job, when we wake up the next day and we find that we can face the day, that God has given us just enough strength to put our feet on the floor and walk through one more day of this, that our mouths would burst open. I see you, God. I acknowledge you. Because I, when I went to sleep last night, was ready to go to sleep and just never get out of bed again. That's where my spirit was. And this morning I awake And I got up. I had the strength to shower and get dressed and face the day. I see you, God. I see what you are doing. I see what you have poured into me. Thank you. Praise be to you. May there never come a time where we forget to see you and to praise you. This is the lesson of Daniel for us in this moment. May we use it in all the moments of our lives. It's always a good practice, but particularly in those impossible, insurmountable, how will I survive and live through this and still be whole moments? May we remember Daniel and Daniel's discipleship. And may we remember that God shows up. I see you, God. I see you. Thank you and praise you for every day, the ways you show up in my life and give me what I need to walk through each moment. May this God, this God of love and gifts and blessings, walk with you, guide you, and be with you in all that you will encounter and face in your week. May you be blessed and loved by God until we meet again. Amen.